Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you and welcome you all to tonight's presentation. I would also like to thank tonight's speakers for inviting us to the valuable time to discuss the topic of consciousness. I hope that you will find tonight's program both interesting and thought provoking Tonight's proceedings will begin with Professor Wildman's presentation. Professor Wildman is a renowned psychologist and expert in consciousness studies. He has published numerous books on this topic. In his presentation tonight, he aims to define consciousness both from the Eastern and Western philosophy point of view, as well as to introduce his theory of reflexive monism, together with an overview of modern vision of consciousness. This will be followed by Dr. Madaraja's presentation. Dr. Madaraj is a neuroscientist and a published author, with many years' experience in studying the functionality of the human brain. During her presentation, she will focus on neural consciousness and what we can learn about different levels of consciousness from brain research. Tonight's third presentation will be given to by Jayda Khan, who is a theoretical physicist as well as an expert in esoteric Hinduism. His presentation will look at different streams of thought in quantum world, including the view that consciousness is the ultimate reality behind the universe, and that consciousness plays a role in collapsing probability into actuality. Tonight's final presentation will be provided by Dr. Eisenhower, who is a renowned spiritual master, a researcher, as well as an expert in comparative religions and spiritual powers. His presentation will approach consciousness in spiritual terms, as an ultimate reality in Gnostic and esoteric disciplines, and its role as a creator of the physical world. Each speaker will provide us with a brief 20 minute presentation. After the presentations, there will be a 20 minute tea break, where refreshments will be set up outside. Following the break, there will be an open discussion forum, where the panel of speakers will be open to taking questions from the audience and topics based on the presentations. I have in the past personally found this part of the presentation of great interest, as the audience opinions and questions have always generated thought work and ideas. So before I hand over tonight's proceedings, may I ask you please switch up all your mobiles and refrain from taking pictures during the presentation. Thank you. So I now hand over the time program to Professor Walker. associated with consciousness, and then um, the other speakers are going to develop particular themes, and as you'll have noticed from the program, they're going to be really leaning eastwards, and, and uh, I want to start off a little bit with how it looks in the Western context. Maybe, maybe I've got time to do some tiny links of, of you know, with, for instance, advice to Vedanta thought. But, but I, I can't do very much with you simply because of the limited time. Um, so I'll be doing a few fragments from my book, Understanding Consciousness, really from the introductory bits. Um, <clears throat> and um, if by way of introduction, I want to uh, say that the, the, you, you will have realised that in the West, consciousness is thought to be a big problem. And um, what I've done is just picked four headings, which in a way summarise part, but at least some of the reasons why in the West we think of consciousness as a problem. So there is a, a debate, a big debate, even about what it is, and um, there's a whole literature associated with trying to answer that question. Um, there's another debate about exactly what the relationship might be between consciousness and material stuff. And, and even um, uh, an enormous debate about what the relationship is between consciousness and the brain. And then, quite separately from that, um, people have agonised about what it does, you know, what's its function, why is it there? And um, um, finally, there's the question of what's the distribution of consciousness? Are, are, are we the only conscious creatures? Is it just mammals, uh, or does perhaps consciousness extend all the way down to the tiny fragments of the universe? So there are other kinds of questions you can ask about consciousness as well, but the, the, the sorts of things that I'm going to have a little bit of time to talk about will relate to these four topics. 
So, <clears throat> if we go back to the first question, um, what is consciousness? Um, what actually happens in the debate and history of this, um, um, uh, thinking about that topic, is that people tend to come from a pre-existing theory. So, rather than an attempt at the phenomena, and I'm, I'm going to come back and do that a little bit later on, um, it tends to be the case that people come to a problem with a pre-existing idea of what the universe is like. And um, I've just listed four basic approaches. Um, um, the classic, if you like, departure point for Western discussion um, tends to be uh, something called substance dualism. Um, it's not that people are substance dualists these days, but, but that, if you like, is the intuitive starting point that people have in their minds when they, for instance, either want to affirm it or oppose it. And these days, most Westerners would want to oppose it. So uh, it's associated, it has an old history, it goes all the way back to Plato, and was formalized by Descartes. You'll find it in modern neuroscience, um, for instance, defended by people like John Eccles. And it basically says the universe is made of two kinds of stuff. There's this kind of material stuff that extends out to in space, but in addition there's another kind of universe, which you might say is the universe of consciousness, soul, spirit, mind. Um, depends on where you're looking in the tradition as to whether these things are lumped together or not. And somehow or other these two universes interact with each other. So that's, and then the question is how do they interact? So on. And then, um, because the problem with interaction is really quite difficult within modern philosophy, um, uh, if you like, a more common position within the West, anyway, has been to say, well, there's a kind of dualism there, but it's, it, it's better to describe it as property dualism. So, if you can imagine, you know, within the Western context, um, uh, which we all live in, when there, if you like, there's a big message. Uh, which is that the ultimate reality is, is, is basically physical and consciousness has to do with the brain, then maybe, uh, yeah, consciousness is a kind of unusual property. It's not like electrochemistry and so on. But maybe it nevertheless is a property of the brain which has special characteristics. And the brain generates these, these special properties or characteristics. And, and so there's a whole literature and intellectual enterprise trying to establish something of that kind. And, and to the Western <coughs> reductionist materialist mindset, if you like, uh, in philosophy and within some science, that's regarded as more palatable in a way, easier to deal with. And then there is uh, also a very strong um, uh, tradition in the West in the 20th century and still persisting in the 21st, which wants to say, um, I know subjectively it feels as if there are special properties of consciousness, but actually if we understood the material world well enough, or understood the brain well enough, then uh, seemingly you know, all properties would kind of fade away because the uh, science would so to speak offer up certain kind of explanation which would make them understandable and we would understand all this as that's material stuff. And so, uh, commonly, uh, two big positions in Western philosophy known as physicalism, um, uh, uh, on one hand, and that just says uh, ordinary conscious experience just is a state of the brain, and there's another related position known as functionalism, which just says, well, it's not actually a state of the brain, it's something the brain's doing. It's a function of the brain, and there are big literature that's associated uh, with, with, that, you know, with, with philosophers trying to establish that to be the case. And that, of course, contrasts in sharp contrast to the classical Eastern uh, position. In fact, I, <clears throat> I spent a month, well, three weeks in India in February, and it was just fascinating to see that the fundamental presupposition is that consciousness is the basis of everything. And that's and, 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 and that, that ultimately you'll find that in classical um, enlightened philosophy and, 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 and related philosophies. And I think some of the speakers that you'll be hearing later will be much more of this, this kind of view. 
so that's just setting out the scene a little bit um, in terms of you know what kind of intellectual space is there, what kind of conceptual space is there that people debate about in terms of what consciousness is. Um, but let's, if we leave that aside for a moment and say, well, all right, uh, we're not maybe absolutely sure what it is, but uh, whatever it is, um, we know we've got brains, we know we've got conscious experience, so somehow or other these two must relate to each other, and if we just think about it in common sense terms, it's, we have all the evidence that we need that there seems to be an interaction between these two. So there's a new death a large body of work that shows that as you change brain states, you change conscious experience. So if you break up, or for example, or um, if, for instance, you see something, and you stimulate the visual system, and then you have a visual experience, that seems to indicate that physical things can have effects on experience things. Um, but equally, um, there's a very large body of evidence that things that we think of as experiences can have effects on things that we think of as physical. So within psychology, for example, we talk in a standard way about early childhood experiences affecting later ways of behaving. Um, uh, we, the, the most well-accepted um, medical um, effect is the placebo effect. It, it basically works on all medical conditions. So the expectation that you're going to get better or that you've got confidence in your, your, your doctor or whatever is already, you know, instigating the healing process. So that's a very clear demonstration of something psychological having effect somehow, you know, by the brain or the body and so on. And, and that, if you, let's say you're a dualist and you think of conscious experiences being like we normally think of them and brains as we normally think of them, that would lead you to what's called dualist interactionism. In other words, there are two things, and they interact with each other. Uh, experiences cause brain states, brain states cause experiences. And, and that's the evidence, you might say. But it's not a position that's accepted within science, or hardly ever accepted in science. And the reason it isn't is because science is in the business of trying to find explanations of how things can be done. And um, so even you know, before you get into the details of the neurochemistry and so on, it's quite difficult to um, envisage how, say, something like feeling, which seems to be a kind of a female thing, can actually have causal effects on something like a neuron, Within science, it's easy to understand how uh, neurochemistry, you know, the firing of, of some neurons might affect the firing of later neurons or other neurons, because all you need to explain are the kind of neurochemical processes. But how a feeling gets in there and makes neurons do something isn't so very easy to understand. Or if you think of conscious experiences subjective and you think of a brain as something objective, then you could say, well, how did something subjective have a causal effect on something objective? Well, just putting the problem you know, in the way it's often put. And then a, a third problem is, um, if you think of the, if some of you have read neurophysiological textbooks, or studied neurochemistry and so on, and you, you read all the way from chapter one to whatever the final chapter is, and look at everything you found in the book, then all the explanations you find of everything that's going on would be in terms of neurochemistry. And, and the truth of the matter is that uh, if you, for instance, let's talk about visual experience, you know, where maybe there's an object out here, in this case a paper cup, and I'm looking at it, so there's a physical stimulus, you know, causes something to happen in my visual system, um, it innovates the uh, exceptional regions of the brain, um, uh, all sorts of associated neurochemical events happen in, in the end, I might pick up the cup, you know, motor neurons get, get stimulated and cause me to close my fingers on the cup and I, I drink, you know, drink water. Um, the nature of a neurophysiological